and give the Lord a real praise. Uh, there's a whole lot going on. Uh, first of all, 19 years is no small feat, just for y'all who don't know. Y'all don't know. Pastoring. <laughs> it is a marvel of God that we're here at this stage, that we are thriving in a vibrant church community, having started with just a few people in our living room, uh, literally a stone's throw from this building. And I was talking to the Lord this morning. I said, Lord, you have been so faithful. I was crying out to you in desperation for how you would do this, how you would put it together. And one step at a time, God has been faithful. One step at a time. Not even one day at a time. It wasn't even one day. Some, the days were like this. I was like, how long is this day going to be before you come through, Jesus? Are y'all following what I'm saying to you? Uh, don't overlook what God has given us. Can, can I just toot my horn for a moment? In, in Jesus' name. I'm going to be like Paul and brag like a crazy man. Um, the beating you take on this journey cannot be explained except you take it. And your pastor's still here. When people drag your name through the mud and put it in the streets, it's painful, and your pastor's still here. 19 years. People have, people have been long enough around me to love me, hate me, and love me again. Preach, Reverend. Because y'all been around church. Y'all know. People love you. They can't stand you. They come back and like, Pastor, you my pastor. You're you the best thing that ever happened in my life. And, and the charge of the pastor is to stay steady through the storm. Can I, can I just toot my horn? I want to brag for a little. Because for 19 years, I've been with the same woman. Stand up, baby. Stand up, babe. Now, it's more like 37 because we, we met in 87. That's 37 years. But 19 years on this journey, I ain't slept with nobody else, wife. Y'all don't know when you got a good pastor. Y'all better give the Lord a praise. You got a pastor who ain't been in the street. I ain't started doing no drugs yet. <laughs> I got no plans for it. My kids still love the Lord. My kids are here. Come stand up, Maya. We got four kids. They still love the Lord, still seek God. They still serve him. Y'all know pastor's kids oftentimes lose their way. You follow what I'm saying? Here's what I'm trying to tell you. Don't sleep on what God has given us. I ain't the best preacher. I ain't the, I ain't the most creative person I ever met. You understand what I'm saying? But I've been, I'm still here. So happy birthday, Messiah. Happy birthday. Um, we got some great opportunities ahead of us, um, and I don't have time to go through all of them. Let me just tell you quickly what we're up, a, you know, what, what we have on our minds really at this stage. We want to finish this farm property back here because it's going to be a massive draw for events in our community, and we will be able to employ people in our community. Uh, we want to finish the, the barn, redo the barn, so that we can have more events. You understand what I'm saying? Um, we we, we want to um, grow our online opportunities and so get really good at caring for the people who are, who are behind, <laughs> well, we don't see them, but they're behind the cameras. Y'all follow what I'm saying? We get real good at that. How many of y'all were blessed by being able to have online ministry in your life during the pandemic? And we're still going to launch our academy for kids. Uh, Little Arrows is what we're calling it. So that's the plan because schools, have, have y'all heard like I've heard how, how out of control schools are? 
for our kids, right? Now, we can't do this alone. We have to do it as a community. We have to do it as a community. We have to, we have to go in together in order to do this. I believe that God wants to do something special on Berryman's Lane. Somebody said to me, in fact, our accountant said to me, we were meeting with him the other day. He said, um, I don't know if y'all realize that for such a young church, you have such a special place. He said, you, you see the property y'all have, nine acres and the potential to, to, to renovate? He said, there are not many churches with what y'all have. And he works with churches all across the country. So I just want to tell you, we have an opportunity. And if you can grab the vision, we can do this together. Amen? Amen. Amen. Is it going to stretch us? Yes. Will we be glad after we've been stretched? Yes. yes. Yeah, you, you never do anything great and crazy without being stretched. You can't do great things without sacrifice. And so I want to invite you uh, to help us finish the year strong. Let me mention this to you. I'm going to preach, I promise you. Um, uh, we, our mortgage for these properties just hit a huge increase so that we are now almost 20% higher, right, because of what we knew when we bought the properties, that there would be a bump. We just didn't know that, that, that mortgage rates would be at nearly 8%. So what that's done is slowed us down from being able to hire people that we would have hired for our high school ministry, for production. Are you following what I'm saying? Because you gotta, you got to pay the mortgage, and you got to save, and you got to tithe, right? And so um, I'm going to ask you to join hands with us to finish this year strong. Y'all like 300000 is a lot of money. Ain't nobody raising no three. You ain't got no faith. Do you know how much money God has? Ask your neighbor, can God get it through you? If God can get it through us, he can get it to us. And if we can, if we can, get, if we can reach our goal, because we're not, we're not anywhere close to our goal right now, but if by the end of the year we can get to our goal, we can accelerate everything God wants us to do in 2025. Everything with just that small bump through the end of the year, we could accelerate all of those pieces and in the next year to two years see them start to fold and come together. Y'all tracking? Yes, sir. So I just want y'all to know I ain't sitting around chewing bubble gum thinking about what I'm what are you gonna say on Sunday? That's not what I'm doing. I'm praying, we're meeting, we're planning, we're trying to execute great things for the house of the Lord our God. Amen? Amen? Come on, give the Lord a praise for that. All right, let's, let's stand and read this word together. We're going to read just a little bit, and then we're going to jump into it. We're wrapping up our series we call uh, Guided by Grace. Somebody say, Lord, guide me. Guide me. Lord, show me the way. Um, we, we've covered some good stuff. Y'all enjoyed this series? Yeah, yeah Amen. Uh, Ron, let's read Luke 17, 1 through 5. In the interest of time, we won't read the passage in Matthew 18. I will simply teach through it in the context of the message, all right? Luke 17, 1 through 5, nice and loud together. Jesus said to his disciples, things that cause people to stumble are bound to come, but woe to anyone through whom they come. It would be better for them to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around their neck than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. So watch yourselves. If your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. And if they repent, forgive them. Even if they sin against you seven times in a day, my Lord, and seven times come back to you, Jesus, Pen. You must forgive them. I feel we need to park it, park it right there. Tell, tell your neighbor, I'm going to need a moment. I'm going to need a moment. I got to process this in my spirit. Seven times? Seven times? Seven times? 
Let's go to verse 5. The apostles said to the Lord what the people said at Messiah. Lord, increase our faith in Jesus' name. Set on down. Let's get into this word. Lord, thank you for this challenge. I want to I teach today from the subject, grace to let it go. Grace to let it go. Grace to let it go. Um, last week we talked about the grace to get well. Today we'll talk about grace to let it go. Um, and let me just add this as a subtext, uh, especially when you can't forget it. It's one thing to talk about letting it go, but what do you do when it can't leave your brain? Okay, here's a question for you. Here's a question for you. Um, who hurt you? Who treated you badly? Who, who abused you? Um, isn't it amazing the stuff that we deal with and we face, and when you're asked a question like, who was it? And I don't mean to trigger anybody, but your brain can go instantly to the face or faces you got the names in your brain instantly. Some of you can recall the very places where the incident took place because pain is so palpable that it sticks with us in our, um, in our memory. And it's not just my memory here, but uh, Dr. Basil Vanderkolk says that it sticks with us in the memory of our DNA so that it's not just what I can see in my mind's eye that somebody did to me, it is also the pain that I carry in my body. He wrote a book, if you haven't read it, called The Body Keeps the Score. And a lot of us are carrying traumatic memories in our body and is showing up in ways that are taking the life out of people. And, and I want to I teach you today, I want to challenge you, that the most difficult thing any of us might ever do in our lives is forgive those who hurt us. I can stand and sing and give God the praise. I can stand and preach or teach. I prefer to teach. Um, I, I can say, hey, the, the Lord is good all the time. All the time. God is and still be carrying the weight of unforgiveness in my spirit. I want to frame today's teaching around five questions. We'll see how far we get. I want to talk about what is forgiveness? Why should we forgive? Exactly when <laughs> should I forgive? How do I forgive? And then finally, um, how do I know whether I have actually fully forgiven. Is this, is this yeah. worth, worth us taking the journey today? Yeah. Uh, shout out to all the people who are with us online. I didn't greet you this morning. In the name of the Lord, I'm glad you're with us. Stay right there. God has something for you. Let's talk about what exactly forgiveness is. Uh, we get help uh, in in the New Testament and in the Old Testament, but I want to park mostly in the New Testament. Uh, go with me to Ephesians 1, verse 7. This might be helpful. Ephesians 1, verses 7 and 8. Um, let's see if they can pull that up. There we go. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. In accordance with the riches of God's grace, 
that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. Uh, in, in this particular passage, Paul speaks of forgiveness as a noun, which means that forgiveness is the thing, but to forgive is the action. Y'all tracking with me? So if there is no verb, there is no noun. Forgiveness is the action that brings about the reality or the presence of the thing. So I must, I must understand that forgiveness begins with a behavior. So, 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 so Jesus says uh, all throughout Matthew 18, uh, forgive. Matthew chapter 6, he says in verses 14 and 15, he says, you need to forgive them so that God will forgive He says, you got to act on this notion, this idea of forgiving. So what exactly is forgiving, whether we're talking about the verb or the noun? Uh, the, the, the word in the Greek means uh, to let something go. It means to leave something. Uh, uh, one, one interesting sense of the word is that i got to leave one place in order to get to another place, implying that if I don't leave where I have been with, with, uh, with, with relationship to the offense that has been uh, enacted against me, I can never get to somebody I'm going somewhere. I'm going somewhere. Could it be that forgiveness has been keeping you from your destiny? Could, could it be that forgiveness has been keeping you from becoming your best? Could it be that forgiveness has been holding you back in your career uh, or under unforgiveness? Could it be that unforgiveness has been keeping you bound so that you can't even be freely you? We've never experienced the real you, the full you, the blessed you, the God ordained and designed you, perhaps because unforgiveness has kept you over here when in fact you should have been way up there. So forgiveness is me letting go or giving up and choosing to keep no longer. I can't stop what happened to me from happening. I can't even erase it from my memory. But I don't have to be bound by the bitterness. Y'all tracking with me? Tell somebody, I got to let it go. I got to let it go. Uh, one sense of the word is to release it. Watch this now. And it's not just that I release what they did to me, but I release them. Is this making sense to anybody? It, it, is, it is, listen, they should come back and apologize to me for what they did to me, and they need to make it right. I'm going to talk about that in a moment. Yeah, they owe you an apology for what they did to you and the pain they inflicted upon you, and they should have come back and made it right because that, in fact, is biblical. But y'all know like I do, there's some folk who will never own nothing and will never come back and make anything right. Y'all been around people who can never uh, be wrong, who, who, who never, they've never hurt nobody, never did, listen, and they, they say stuff like, um, you, you need to charge that to my head, not to my heart. Look here, I don't care whether it came from your head or your heart, that hurt. I don't care whether you meant to do it or it was a mistake, the fact that it came through you is the, is the, make, creates this experience that I had because of you. Can you own what you did, but because you won't own it, is anybody going to help me preach up in here today? I'm preaching for my own 19th anniversary. I might as well preach. But, but, but since you won't own it, or perhaps because you have gone on, How many of us 
have surrendered our lives to folk who are negre. They hurt you. And God is dealing with them in eternity. Somebody shout, let it go. So to forgive, is to, it is to release them. The Old Testament pattern requires, uh, we don't have time for this, but in Numbers chapter 5, write this in your notes. I'm going to have to send y'all all of my notes. You can have them. I'll, it's free. No, it's not free. I have to charge y'all, yeah? <laughs> Forgiveness is the intentional act of releasing someone from the debt they owe you for how they wounded you. In the Old Testament pattern, if someone harmed their neighbor, they were, they were supposed to um, own it, ask forgiveness, watch this now, and make restitution. Restitution meant they had to add one-fifth of the value. So, for example, if they killed somebody's cow accidentally or intentionally, they would have to not only replace the cow, but they would have to add one-fifth of the value, which is 20%. Isn't it amazing that God breaks it up into fifths? Because y'all were here last week, and you know that five is the number of? He says, I want you to express to them with grace your earnest desire to make it right. Isn't that something? In the New Testament, um, the pattern is uh, the offender should repent, uh, should ask for forgiveness, and should make restitution. And Jesus basically says, but even if they don't. Even if they don't, we release them. So forgiveness is to, is to release them from the debt that they owe to make it right with me. That means you'll be able to start walking around looking at people who hurt you and be like, you good. You good. I'm straight. I'm straight by the grace of God. By the grace of God. It's by the grace of God. I'm not going to punch you in your face right now. I'm not, God, God has been kind to me. God has been good. I, I, I had a right to punch you in the face. I had a... I had a right to put this stick upside your head, but because the Lord has been on my side and because I got a word in church on Sunday, I'm going to go ahead and let that go. You can step back, but I'm going to let that go. Don't come nowhere near me. Just because I forgave you, by the way, does not mean I trust you. Doesn't even really mean I want to be around you. I forgave it, I let it go, I let you go. You just don't need to be all up in here with me. Back up. All right, what is forgiveness? Y'all got that? Forgiveness is what? The re three people got it. I, all that work I just did. Forgiveness is the, the release. All right, so when should we forgive? Pastor, I'm glad you asked. I'm glad y'all asked. Because sometimes we want to forgive immediately. Let's go back to um, Luke 17, 3 through 4. Let's go back to Luke. Y'all remember Luke? Luke says, um, he says, watch yourselves. If your brother or sister, sister sins against you, what will we, what will we do? Hmm. Mm, mm. He says, rebuke them, and if they, <laughs> if they repent, <laughs> don't you love the Bible? Slow down long enough to see what it's really saying. Uh, so watch yourselves. If your brothers, if they sin against you, rebuke them. Let me just talk about this for a moment, because some of us have not confronted the people who hurt us. We, we've not rebuked them. We've talked about them. We haven't rebuked them. We've talked about them to other people. We just never rebuked them. We've been on Facebook. We've been on X. We've been on IG. We, we've been on TikTok. 
make it send a subtle messages, but we've never rebuked them. And the Bible says, if they sin against you, go and show them their fault, go and tell them where they were wrong. They don't have to agree with you. They don't have to like you. They don't even have to want to hear from you. But the Bible says, don't go running to forgive people when you're afraid to tell them because the truth and the fact is part of the healing and the cleansing is to say what you did to me was horrible and hurtful and ugly and mean and I've been trying to walk around forgiving you but the truth is I still want to and whatsoever you do in your life don't ever do that to anybody else Somebody said, just slow your roll, slow your roll, slow your roll. Um, until you grieve what you lost, it will be difficult for your forgiveness to be authentic. It's interesting that the order of Jesus on his way to the cross, before he says, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do, he grieves over Jerusalem, and I think it is not only Jerusalem because of their rejection of him, but I think there's something healthy and right about him grieving even though he knew he was going to give his life on the cross. He was grieving that they were, they were in rejection toward him, but by the time he gets to the cross, he can say to the soldiers who, who were in cahoots with Jerusalem, Father, forgive them. You said, well, Pastor, what you trying to say? Um, don't be so quick to forgive that you don't really process what happened. Because sometimes we run to forgive in order, like I, I, the Lord told me to forgive. If your spouse is cheating on you, uh, forgive me, I thought you said you were going to forgive me. Forgive me, you going to forgive me? Or forgive me, forgive me. Because, you know, it, it ain't just dudes who cheat, just so we're clear. You said you was going to forgive me. <laughs> I was, but I'm grieving right now. In fact, I, I, I'm going to forgive you because the Lord said, but right now, right now I need a moment to grieve. And can I just tell you what it has done to me? You have shaken my entire world. You, you've got me so nervous and insecure, I don't know whether I'm coming or whether I'm going. Somebody help me out of here. I, I, I don't even know how to look at you right now. I don't even know how to trust you right now. I don't even know how to live in relationship with you right now. We can't talk about forgiveness right now. I'm going to need a moment. I'm, I'm going to need a day. I'm going to need a few weeks. I might need a couple months. But as for, as for right now, please back up and let me grieve what I'm going through. To rebuke and to grieve are, in essence, um, to be real about the pain. And we got a lot, of a lot of Christian teaching that tells people, don't worry about the pain, just forgive, and God will fix it. But the same God put in the scriptures to grieve it and to rebuke it. Is this helping anybody? Give the Lord a praise if this is helpful. Give the Lord a praise. Thank you, Lord. Can, can I take about five more minutes of your precious time on my anniversary? I'm asking y'all for time on my anniversary. This, this my, I'm going to preach all day if I feel like it. <laughs> People back in time, no, I'm going to walk out on your anniversary. <laughs> uh, why should we forgive? I'm going to give you four reasons why, why we should forgive. Okay, y'all ready? Uh, Matthew 6, 14 to 15 says what? Forgive so that God will forgive you. That's, that's pretty powerful, isn't it? You could tie up God's forgiveness of you because you won't forgive somebody else. Hold up, I thought you said 
that when we come to faith in Jesus, all of my sins have been cast on him so that past, present, and future, all of my sins are washed away. So there is a positional truth here, which is that all of your sins have been removed so that when God sees you, he sees the Holy Spirit dwelling in you and sees the blood applied to your life. So that positionally you have been. But from a practical living day to day, he says, what you have become forgiven, you must now do. It is not that God removes his forgiveness, past, present, and future. It is that God will, cannot allow you to experience it in the depths of your being. Okay, come with me to, y'all see I've been in my Bible. Y'all had me working for, y'all had me working for all my anniversary. Uh, come with me to 1 John chapter 3, verses 18 through 22. 1 John, 1 John 3. Watch this. Dear children, let us not love with or speech, but how? This is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. Uh, if our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts. We know, right? We know, we know that his forgiveness is greater than what I'm experiencing. We know that we've been forgiven. He's greater than what's happening in my heart. Watch this now. And he knows everything. He knows that you're struggling. He, he knows that we've been forgiven. He knows that it's still hurting. Come on, help me somebody. He knows that you want to go over there and cuss them out in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, watch this, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we keep his commands and do what pleases him. Remember we said forgiveness is an action. Watch this now. He said, if I don't forgive you, I will carry the unforgiveness in my spirit. And the Holy Spirit will be convicting me in such a way that my heart will condemn me. So I need to forgive you so that I can be released from not forgiving you. So that I can open up the channels to God so that when I call on the name of the Lord, the Lord hears my cry late in the midnight hour as stuff starts to move and turn around by the power and the authority in Jesus' name. He says, so I got to forgive so, so I can be forgiven. Oh, here's another one. So the other person is not imprisoned by your unforgiveness. Has someone ever done something to you and they were genuinely sorry, repentant? And you're like, nah, every time I see you, I'm going to remind you. Who am I preaching to? Give, give, come on, put that pinky up there. Shame the devil. Every time I see you, I'm going to remind you what a nasty, horrible... <laughs> Watch this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we don't have time to turn there, uh, 1 Corinthians 5, 1 through 6, there's a young man uh, who was sleeping with his father's wife. Somebody said, that's Nat. Somebody said, that's, thank you. See, I love real church folk, right? That's Nat. Ain't nobody got no business. And, and the apostle Paul says, y'all should have put him out of the church. Why y'all going to keep letting this go on? He says, I'm coming to you in the spirit to deal with this. Y'all should have dealt with that because this is going to make the whole church jacked. By the way, can you get your, your sex life together and stop messing up the church? Could it be that we can't move where God wants us to move because 
how we carry our sexual practices against the word of God. If we're going to work, we're going to work. Come on. Ask your neighbor, are you the hold up? Are you asking him, are you the hold up? Look at him good. Look at him good. Look at him. Look at him good. It's a rough, it's a rough ride up in here today. Ask him, are you the hold up to what God wants to do at Messiah? Because you, you, you freaking. If you could see what I see, people like this. <laughs> My Lord and my God. Uh, and in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, um, <laughs> y'all funny. They're like, this dude is crazy. He is off the charts today. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, 5 through 8. Watch this now. But if anyone has caused grief, he's not grieved me, but all of you to some extent. He says, now, not to be too severe. He says, this punishment, which was inflicted by the majority, is sufficient for such a man. So that on the contrary, you ought rather to forgive and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. Do you have any idea how many people are incarcerated right now who have repented and called on the name of the Lord, but, but, but people will not forgive them? We have a sick penal system. An industrial incarceration complex that has people locked up for petty bags of weed that now some folk can get loans to build businesses with. And, there, and we got people carrying the weight of unforgiveness. And Paul says, we got to be careful not to imprison other people with our unforgiveness. Somebody shout, let it go. Let it go. I'm going to give you two more reasons, and i gotta, I got to land my plane. So we're not imprisoned by our own unforgiveness. Okay, let's go to Matthew 18, 32 to 35. Do I need to finish this next week? No. They're like, no. <laughs> All right, Matthew 18, 32 to 35. Watch this. Now instead, you ought to forgive and come on. Oh, that's 2 Corinthians. Let's go to Matthew chapter 18, 32 to 35. We're trying to, we're trying to get some production help, y'all. Can y'all help in the production room? 18, 32 to 35. Uh, then his master... After he had called him, said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Y'all remember the dude who, who was, his master came to him? He was like, bro, you owe me thousands of bags of gold. Thousands. He said, oh, please, 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 forgive me, forgive me. I'll, 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 I'll pay it to you soon. The master goes, get up, man. All right, you forgive him. You're good. He walked down the street, see the dude that owes him 10 bags of silver. You got my money? Oh, you better have my money. You ain't got my money? <laughs> you got to read your Bible. See, the problem is people don't read their Bibles. And he wouldn't forgive the dude who owed him far less than he owed somebody else. And the text says, um, should you not have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. 
Mm. So my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. He says, you can be locked up in the prison of your own unforgiveness. And God has more for us. We talked a little bit about when we should forgive. I don't want to, we just don't have time, y'all. We, <laughs> um, this good? Yeah. All right, we'll have to come back to this because I don't want to, I don't want to take us too long. Uh, I got a lunch appointment and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> not, not really, not really. All right, let, let, me, let me land it this way. Let me land it this way. Uh, I, was having fr- I was having dinner with a dear friend of mine um, a couple of nights ago, and he's Jewish. And um, we were talking about relationships and unconditional love. And I was able to take him to a passage in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, God died for us. Jesus died for us, gave his life for us, forgave us. His eyes opened like this. He'd never been taught the power of living a life of forgiveness and unconditional love. He said, can you take me back through those talking points because I got to go and share this with my woman. I was like, bro, I got you. I said, I'm also going to send you some scriptures, these scriptures that I referenced. I sent it to him the next morning. He said, I needed all of this. Thank you so much. I'll be reflecting on this. Here's what I want you to see. When people know that forgiveness is possible, the lights start to come on about the love of God. I don't know who's in this room today who needs the forgiveness of Jesus in your life. Can I tell you the forgiveness of Jesus is available for you? Come on, stand with me. We got to close. Y'all know how this goes. Stand on your feet with every head bowed, every eye closed.